Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. This is Ellen Gottesdiener here. Welcome. Now, my goal today is to recast perceptions that you might have about agile requirements and business analysis. And I want to leave you with a clearer picture of how it really works when you're doing agile business analysis and requirements well. Here's my core message. Requirements and business analysis in an agile context are foundational to building great teams who are building great software. And when you do this well, your outcomes are going to be better. You'll have better products you're going to deliver sooner, more satisfied customers, You'll, your delivery will be more productive, you'll contribute to your organization's bottom line, and a really great benefit is that you will experience joy in work. Now, we at EBG Consulting uh, are the innovators who brought collaborative requirements discipline to the Agile community. And so we focus on helping organizations do that collaboration so they can discover and deliver great products. My own personal Agile journey started about two years prior to the Agile Manifesto being published online uh, back in 2001. And it was using Agile practices with iterative and incremental development in a regulated software product. And I just want to share that we at EBG are committed to continuing to contribute to our various communities that focus on agile product management, requirements and business analysis, and agile project management, which includes the PMI, PBA, agile extension, and introducing techniques such as agile open jam and open space at the, these various conferences as well as in my role as chair of the Agile Alliance program for analysis and product management in Agile. So these experiences are based on lots of real world experience. And I'm often asked these questions. In an Agile context, people ask. They ask, does analysis actually happen? And they ask, are requirements needed? And how can requirements possibly be Agile? Now, what's interesting is <clears throat> these questions come about from a variety of disciplines, people that might be scrum masters, analysts, coaches, project management, product owners, testers, architects, UX. These are common questions that people have. And what I want to do is tell you a story. This is a true story about agile requirements and business analysis for a team that I work with recently. And I think it illustrates a common situation that teams have when they're trying to manage the art and science, if you will, of requirements and business analysis in an Agile context, because they were struggling with many of these same questions. I'm going to call them the S team. S because they were stuck and struggling. And like many teams, they're planning an analysis centered around user stories, which many of you might be familiar with. And yet, they couldn't get their stories done within an iteration, a sprint, using Scrum terminology. During the demos, their product owner and other subject matter experts were disappointed and asking a lot of challenging questions. Um, and the team just was not getting fraction. They were really frustrated. The business analyst, I'll call him Bob, Bob the BA, he confided in me that he was really torn about how was he going to leverage his skills and work well with the team? How was he going to get in a flow? You know, they had lots and lots of stories in their backlog, but they just see, just couldn't get in a good flow. And Polly, the product owner, again, that's not really her name, but I'll just call her Polly, the product owner, she was really overstretched. She was trying to work directly with the customers, get, quote, out of the building, to visit and observe the customers using the product, and also navigate all the executive pressures within the company that were on her. But at the same time, the team was demanding a lot of her time for all these agile rituals, like planning and demonstrations and refining sessions and so forth. So she was pretty stressed out. Sam, the scrum master, he was new. And he had been there seven weeks and had worked with other Agile teams, so he had a pretty good experience uh, experience and background on this, but he was really struggling to get the team's 
to focus and agree on their stories and what they meant. And the team kept uh, being late. They couldn't deliver their stories. They couldn't get done. They found defects in the middle of their sprints. Now, this team was operating under many of the myths about agile requirements and business analysis that I'm going to share today. And then what we'll do is we'll discuss the realities, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a peek into how working with the S team, we got them out of their mire, if you will, to get them unstuck. So let's first start with some of the myths around agile, I'm sorry, around analysis in general, like that it is slow, inflexible, meticulous, little or infrequent business involvement, lots of documentation, and roles are very, very clearly defined. That's typically how people view analysis. And now let's explore some common myths about Agile. Oh, this is a very common one. It's just do it. It's unstructured, sort of cowboy coding. There's no or little planning and analysis. Forget about requirements. Maybe you just have user stories. And there's no documentation. So folks, what I want to do today is let's get real, because these are all myths. In fact, and in practice, Agile analysis is really disciplined, and it requires a lot of collaboration, communication, exploration, exposition um, to do well. So to debunk the myths, I want to share with you how it really works, the realities of how it really works when it works well. And there are five realities that I want to share. First, that we focus on delivering a value product. We act as product partners. We discover requirements just in time, use structured conversations, and confirm before, during, and after delivery. Um, so as we consider these, again, I'll give you a little bit of a peek into the S team. So let's get started. Let's talk about reality number one, deliver valued product. That's the most fundamental reality about doing this right. And here's the key thing. The value of Agile is about the word itself. Not the A word, but the V word. Not Agile, but value. Because as you probably well know, the goal in Agile, the big why, is that we deliver a high value product. So that image of the box, that represents your product. And your product can be, might be a software product, it might be a system with hardware and software and firmware, and it might also include services. It might be a physical product as well, some combination. So this product provides value to its customers, and the goal is to deliver a working, functioning, fully tested um, product or portions of a product, I should say, in as short a time as possible. It might be a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months if necessary, but the preference is always on a shorter scale. So what we are doing is we're delivering the product, of course, but delivery depends on discovery. Delivery depends on discovery. Discovery needs to be in balance with delivery. So as you see here, we have discover, deliver, discover, deliver, discover, deliver. This ongoing cycle, that's the essence of Agile. Now, if we focus for a minute on this word here, discover, wonder if you think about it, what other words conjure in your mind when you see that word? So <clears throat> for me, some of the words that jump out are elicit, analyze, learn, value, plan. Those are some of the things that, that pop up for me. So um, discovery is not about, quote, gathering. I'm trying to ban that word gather. It's not about gathering. It's much more proactive and interactive and collaborative. And when we think about discovery, our focus is on this. Again, value. Value, value, value. Everybody talks about value. That's the mantra for using Agile practices. But what does value really mean? I mean, value is the cornerstone for doing our Agile analysis and planning. It's the basis for prioritizing requirements about what you're going to build. 
it's really the foundation of what you're going to deliver and actually just as important what you are not going to deliver. So what do we mean by value? Well, I like to define value as fair return or equivalent for goods, services, or money for something exchanged. Fair return or equivalent for goods, services, or money exchanged. So value is about increasing revenue. It's about avoiding costs, like reducing operational expenses, protecting revenue, such as protecting your revenue from penalties of regulatory noncompliance, or protecting your revenue that you might pay, pay in return for delay of delivering your product to the market. Value can also be about improving your service, such as specifically a greater speed or usability. So really, this is the end game. To understand value, we need to know things like the vision for your product, its goals, objectives, risks, benefits, costs, and balance these things. This is the end game. And we also, as we'll see in an upcoming reality, we also need to understand the people who we need to partner with to achieve this end game. Now, let's talk about Team S, my struggling and stuck team. So they were frankly really struggling with understanding the end game and what were they trying to achieve in their next delivery cycle, which, is, which was a two month period of time. And how were they gonna benefit, benef balance the benefits with the risks and dependencies? So what we ended up needing to do was focus on value for their next release and revisit and actually strengthen and clarify vision. We also use some tools to specify objectives more quantitatively and figure out, well, how are they going to validate they were on the right track? And what was really interesting for them in working with the product uh, owner was they realized they had multiple views of value. One was operational efficiencies, gaining those. Another was around retention, their, what they called their partner retention in using the product or having the users of the product be in the know, and then there was even a value around upsell. But they, can have, they can't have everything. So the product owner said, we really need to focus on the operational efficiencies. So with that in mind for their next release, we defined a theme and we clarified um, how we were gonna move forward, and that drove a lot of selection choices in the requirements. So that's number one, the reality number one, deliver valued product. So let's look at the next one. This is about acting as product partners. So what I wanna do is let's talk about people. You know, the ones who have a stake or an interest in the product. All right, let's think with an agile mindset. And when we do that, we recast the people who have a stake or interest in the product, not as stakeholders, but actually thinking of them as partners. In fact, thinking of them as product partners. Now, many of you, I know you use that term, stakeholders. It's a very common term. However, that term implies that these people have a stake, but they're not necessarily collaboratively engaged in sharing and learning and exploring and innovating and adapting and weighing their unique interests and balancing them. That's why we prefer to use the language of that term partners and product partners because successful agile teams really think and act as product partners who will enlighten each other and learn from each other and continually engage in focusing on that value. Now, partners come from three realms and we're gonna consider each and we're gonna think about what they value because Value is in the eyes of the beholder. So we need to know who are those beholders. One of those beholders is the customer. And those are the users and choosers. They, we want to know what do they value, those users and choosers and people that might advise them. At its core, in its essence, they value a product that is desirable. We need to, though, dig into what that really means about desirable. Obviously, it's gonna to have to do with usefulness and usability of the product, 
but desirability can depend on context, you know, uh, for that for that uh, customer. For example, if you're um, purchasing an online product, you want it to be fast. You also you also want to trust the product, right? So security is going to be important. Or if your product is an app on a mobile phone, it's got to be easy to use, right? So another thing that we really need to do is understand who these partners are and what is their specific view of value. The other realm that we, of course, want to focus on is the business. This is the sponsor, product champion, my preferred term over product owner, and people that advise them. And at its essence, these partners really, really care about a viable product. And that might be around revenue or operating expenses. It could be around brand projection, market penetration. Again, it's contextual. We need to figure out who are these people and what are their value considerations. The third partner are the technology partners. Of course, these are all the people that develop and deploy the product and support and train and install the product. And at its essence, they care about a product that is feasible, right? So when we really think about product partners, we are having a balanced view of the product and what they value because partners act and speak differently than just mere stakeholders. Partners kind of have the attitude of, hey, let's envision and deliver the product together. Uh, we communicate directly, not through surrogates. We have knowledgeable decision makers engaged. And we like to say that when really in a partnership, they focus more on their goal, not the role. Um, Mary Gorman, my co-author in Discover to Deliver, we, we wrote an article some number of years ago that's kind of become a little bit of a meme in the Agile community. And the title of the article is, It's the Goal, Not the the role. Now the other thing that's important about this, understanding our partners and their value considerations, is, well, just think about the world of design thinking. And you think about successful product innovation. One of the keys is obtaining different perspectives. That's really, really important when we understand all of the values. Now a caution here, because in our travels and our working with many Agile teams, we focus, we see that many of them focus on you know, one or two of those partners, not putting those partners in balance and not rechecking what their value considerations are. So you might be thinking, all right, well, so how do they work as partners? What are some of the tools and techniques they use to ensure they're really collaborating richly and succinctly and efficiently? Stay tuned because that's coming up in the next three realities. Uh, but I'll tell you that when you do do this, you're going to turn competing uh, ideas into cohesive, high-value products. So with my S team, one of the things that was essential for us to do was pull in, bring in people from the field and learn information about their value and their usage of the existing product that was being replaced. And we created something called personas to help us understand how they think and work and one of the things that we discovered was how they are um, actually impeding operational efficiencies by their workarounds with the current product. And we did this by using a product options board and creating a value corner. Now, a product options board is a tool to help partners collaboratively build a shared understanding. And in that value corner, in a matter of literally 45 minutes in a well-designed collaborative work session, all these diverse partners started to get a shared understanding of really what value was. So to summarize number two reality, we want to act as product partners. So let's turn to the reality number three, this idea of discovering requirements just in time. I got to tell you, we really need to relieve ourselves from the fantasy <laughs> and the burden that we can know requirements up front. It's actually very rare in product development that you know all your requirements up front. Product requirements have too much uncertainty. You know, we really don't know exactly what we need until we start building the product and getting feedback on it. So that's also called a wicked problem. Some of you might have heard that. That the problem space and the solution space, they really overlap. Now, 
that does not mean that you ignore the long view, like where you're going to go. You really do need to see requirements from different views. And as you know, requirements, Agile rather, re re relies on delivering small bits of functionality over time. And you do this by constantly planning using different planning horizons or views, the big view, the preview, and the now view. You're constantly planning and calibrating the, the precision and, and the granularity of your requirements and business analysis based on what planning horizon you're talking about. So again, regardless of what specific method or brand of Agile that you are using, you are, you are looking at the big view, the preview, and the now view, or portfolio for the big view, release the preview, and if you're using Scrum, a time box model, it would be uh, a time box like a sprint. And if you're using Kanban, a flow-based model, the now view is your work in progress. So let me just tell you, it really is a myth that you don't look out in time. It's just that the granularity of what you look out on uh, will vary. And you need business analysis at all three planning horizons. Now in terms of the time that that might take, you know, your mileage will vary, okay, with these time horizons, whether your big view really might be a product roadmap taking you out, an agile product roadmap, by the way, taking you out two years or release the preview two months or today or a two-week sprint, you know, it's going to vary a little bit, again, depending on your product. One of our um, clients builds huge product, a product that runs and operates windmills that sits up on the top of gigantic windmills. Their roadmap is more like a seven-year roadmap. Um, a team that I just worked with last week, our roadmap ended up being an eight-month roadmap. So this will vary depending on your product, your market, um, the project context, and so forth. And also, for those of you familiar with scaling, uh, and think about a project management perspective for Agile delivery, these three planning horizons align in this way. The big view is your portfolio, the preview is program, and now view would be the team uh, perspective. Now, I want to say let's really be careful about these views when it comes to the word requirements. When you're talking, say, two years out, the big view and thinking about requirements, they're not really requirements. They're really things that you want. And when you're looking, say, at a release preview level, maybe a month or two out, depending on your product again, but they're still just things that you need. It's not until you're at the now view that you really are talking about requirements, that you have very, very clear, specific, unambiguous requirements with acceptance criteria that are completely testable. So what about Team S? Well, it turned out Team S was iterating themselves into a box. They actually had no concept of a release, of the preview. They were just trying to iterate and iterate and build stories out. And they were spending a lot of time trying to smooth stories out in the backlog, their, their baseline of requirements. And then they were scrambling right before iteration or sprint planning and having really long, laborious planning meetings. So they needed to get in a rhythm of refining backlog items prior to planning and allowing items in the backlog to be big and chunky. Or like I say a lot, that a lumpy backlog and a dynamic backlog is a healthy backlog. So a lumpy backlog, it's OK to have items that are big wants, boulders. It's OK to have items that have been chopped down. Those boulders have been chopped down into, say, rocks as needs. But the rocks turned into pebbles with very clear acceptance criteria. Now you're talking about requirements. So we calibrate our analysis work based on our planning horizon. And to summarize, we discover requirements in that way just in time. Now, the fourth Agile reality is about using structured conversations. Now, Agile projects, obviously, you need business analysis. The idea of a structured conversation 
is a lightweight framework to guide the partners so they can collaboratively learn about the product and decide what to do. Now, many of you may be familiar with the Agile Manifesto, and one of the principles is the most, is quote, the most effective and efficient method for conveying information to and within the delivery te development team is face-to-face -face conversations. So I want to pick up on that word conversations, because you may remember the myth that, you know, business analysis is slow and flexible, lots of documentation, and, and, and Agile is really unstructured, kind of just do it, no analysis, and so forth. Well, what we discovered is we really need to bring back that cowboy idea and bring the pendulum back to having some discipline. But we need to have conversations, and not just random conversations. They need some structure. To converse well, we humans, we need some structure. So the structure conversation is simply a metaphor for this ongoing, systematic, collaborative exploration, evaluation of product options, and then confirming that we have a good understanding. So it looks like this. We start by exploring requirements or product options. Then we slice those options into smaller sets based on value. So you see, value is our slicing mechanism. And the conversation's not over until we confirm that we're crystal clear of expectations for the delivered product using verification and validation techniques, which, which I'll discuss in a bit. So this is the cycle, explore, evaluate, and confirm. And this lightweight framework guides partners as they learn about options and decide what to deliver. And this is practices that we've been working on for over seven years and continue to calibrate. And it's based on slicing for value. The other thing that's really important about our conversations is we want to use the same meta pattern at all planning horizons, at all views. Remember that? The preview, the big view, the preview, the now view. So. If any of you also have studied um, design thinking or collaborative patterns, you'll see that this follows a meta pattern in design thinking uh, known often as diverge converge or open close. Yeah? And in my first book, Requirements by Collaboration, I woke, wrote about a collaboration pattern called expand and contract. So this really follows how, how we humans really need to work. So let's take a moment and look at the structured conversation, the exploration part. And we'll look at each, each part in turn. But let's start looking at what those nuggets, which are options, what is it that we're really exploring here? Well, we need to look holistically at options, at product options, which turn into requirements. And so to help us discover and develop and test requirements, we look at seven product dimensions. The user dimension is the people, systems, and devices that interact with the product. The interface dimension is how those users connect with the product. The action dimension or are the capabilities offered, the product offers to the users. The data dimension is the information and data that the product retains. The control dimensions are the policies and regulations and rules that the product must enforce. The environment dimension. So that's the physical location of users that are interacting with the product, as well as the product's technology platforms. What are the hardware and software platforms? And for those of us that also work on physical products, it includes the physical properties of the product and, and access modes. That's the environment dimension. And of course, quality attributes. Quality attributes are the property properties, rather, that qualify the product's operation as well as development. You know, little things like security, usability, reliability, testability. I'm laughing at that because many Agile teams are guilty of not focusing on that quality attribute dimension. And it's critical. Now, I want to make a really important point here. We want to look together.
at all seven product dimensions holistically. And when those of you that come from a requirements um, background, as, as I do and have expertise in this, you know from classic requirements, the F word. <laughs> and that F word is functional. And the functional requirement dimensions are right here, the user, action, data, and control. And then you know the other lousy word that we have to live with called non-functional, and that's interface, environment, and quality attribute. Now, again, we're encompassing both those, quote, functional and non-functional. The point is, is that we need to make them equal citizens as we do our exploration work. You know, with the S team, when we were doing this work using our product options board, the user experience person grabbed my arm and pointed to the wall and said, oh, this is holistic requirement. So this was really powerful for the S team, for them to together, the testers, customers, devs, architects, uh, and, and all of these stakeholders to get engaged. And one of the things that happened for them was at the interface dimension, they realized they were missing several key interfaces and the data that supported those interfaces, which could have really had a big impact on their ability to deliver value for that release and get the operational efficiencies that they were really looking for. So let's take a moment now and go through the second part of the conversation, which is around evaluating. And this is where we're selecting the high value options. And we assemble those high value options into what is called a story. And many of you are familiar with this, I'm sure. The classic template for writing a story is, as a user role, I need to do some action so I get some benefit. And some of you may flip that a little. So you put the, so I get some benefit. As a user role, I want to do some action. And as you know, probably the benefit is going to align to the value, uh, the value considerations for that particular stakeholder. So let's take an example story. And this story is about a buyer who needs to purchase a book so they can enjoy reading the book. Well, when we think of it with our multicolored glasses on with the seven product dimensions, which you notice that we actually use colors semantically, which really helps the conversation, and we use images. Well, let's dive into this black and white story and color it up, having looked at seven product dimensions. And maybe it's not just any buyer. Our focus for value purposes is a repeat buyer. And the purchasing action is going to happen with them purchasing a new book, not a used book, or, uh, yeah, not a used book, and they're going to pay with a credit card. So that's blue, that's data stuff, so they can enjoy reading it. Well, you know, as you can see, the story really just talks about the user and the action and might mention data. But in our conversations and doing optioning, we also discovered uh, that we had various rules, and we might have selected just the rules around credit card. It might be other rules. I'm simplifying this example, but there might be other rules around the types of credit cards and so forth. But we've sliced and figured out, OK, we have to have rules around the credit card. And we know that we need to inventory, uh, interface with the inventory system. And we know that we're going to do the purchasing is going to take place online. And we've looked at response time, which is one of the quality attributes needing to be three seconds. So as you can see, we've looked at all of these dimensions and evaluated, picked high value options, and had a much more richer conversation about what that little chunk of an idea of that story might be. So what about the S team? Well, using the seven product dimensions um, really busted up a lot of the conversation. As I mentioned, they missed some interfaces that we started talking about. Another really interesting thing that happened was that when we talked about the environment, there was a, a, a little bit of an argument and a debate that broke out about the devices that their field uh, folks would be using. Would they be using pads, mobile devices, or web-based device? And that also was something that our product owner needed to make some tough choices around 
for that next release. But it was only through doing the optioning and evaluating and slicing for value that those conversations got to that point. Well, I'm kind of not done with this idea of the structured conversation because another really, really key thing that great teams do is they accelerate their conversations by using visual models. Now, if you consider the fact that 90% of information transmitted to our brains is visual for sighted people, this is a no-brainer. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> it's a no-brainer that we want to use visuals. Uh, one research shows that we can process visuals 60,000 times faster. Um, and um, so <clears throat> the structured conversations then need to include modeling. And this is something that analysts are really good at or need to be really good at, knowing which models to choose for which dimensions, which will amplify the conversation. Uh, so for example, for the data dimension, data model and a state diagram. For the interface dimension, a context diagram. And at the now view, prototypes um, and navigation flows, uh, the action dimension, process maps, story maps, and so on. Mm -hmm. Now the key, though, is that Agile teams don't model themselves into a hole and make these gorgeous, pretty models that they then have to store and you know that get old and age. The point is to model organically, just enough to support that current planning horizon. Yeah? So the models will have varying levels of granularity. And we find that working tactically with low fidelity, like using post-its and markers on, on posters and walls. And that's what happened with Team S. It was just coming up, you know, literally in a seven-minute mock-up of, of a context diagram when we were focused on the interface dimension that we found those missing interfaces. And the data model pointed out some data um, that was really crucial for their operational efficiencies that um, they wouldn't have otherwise discovered. So discovery workshops, and this work, this isn't about sitting around and writing stories on an index card. It's a lot of energy and a lot of interaction, small groups and moving from group to group, and of course, a bit more orchestration if you have a distributed team, but you're still making use of these same principles. Yeah? So the sum, to, to summarize, then, we use structured conversations. Now I want to get to one of the facts that uh, this last reality that has to do with the third part of the conversation, confirmation. We confirm before, during, and after delivery. So by before delivery, what do I mean? Well, analysis is not done until the product partners can confirm, until they can check their shared expectation of the requirements that are going to be delivered. And by after delivery, what we do is we analyze outcomes. Did we achieve the outcomes that we wanted? So the before delivery confirmation is about verification. The after delivery is about validation. Remember the V and V for those of you requirements folks out there, verification and validation. Um, so say the business has a objective around increasing sales by, say, 15% in the next quarter. Well, after delivery, at the end of the quarter, you can't just test to see if you've gotten that you know, result. It's going to be a little bit of a lagging indicator. You may have to keep checking those results after a quarter or two. So when we do the um, confirmation, we want to look at lagging indicators, but also, as much as possible, leading indicators as well. A team that I recently worked with, we decided one of our useful leading indicators was going to be how many um, people in this community they were focused on globally downloaded the open source version of their product prior to the actual real release of the product. So let's turn back to our structured conversation. And again, what we're talking about is explore, evaluate, and confirm. So I want to punch out this piece around confirmation. And really, we confirm to learn. So requirements, which encompass those seven product dimensions, requirements are explored using examples. 
tests execute examples. Requirements are verified with those tests. And the examples validate the requirements. <laughs> so this is really a beautiful thing. Now, examples are real cases, real data that all the partners you know, can use and speak about very concretely, very, very in a daily way. And you know, our technology partners, particularly our testers, they adore examples, as well we should, as do our product owners, because they turn into acceptance tests. Some of you may be familiar with the term behavior-driven development. That's, that's um, one of the ways that we can um, actuate, make real those examples in tests, is by using a behavior-driven development tool uh, like data tables or one using a structure called given, when, then, that you write very detailed examples for different scenarios. And there's a number of open source tools out there for those software people out um, listening today. Like, they have some funny names, but like Cucumber, uh, EZB, FIT, which stands for Framework for Integrated Test, or Fitness, SpecFlow, and more. So the idea is let's make it real. Let's confirm our understanding of the requirements with real examples. The other really cool thing about this is that those examples help us break the models that we built, those visual models. As Chris Matz likes to use the expression, break the model. Um, so let me repeat. Requirements, which encompass those seven product dimensions, are explored with examples. Tests execute the examples, requirements are verified with tests, and the examples validate the requirements. Now this is something that the S team really picked up on. We really got rocking when we started using examples. We started mocking them up in flip chart paper, and then soon after, within a day, uh, the analyst and tester worked together putting those in Cucumber, uh, which was the tool that, of choice for that team. And we started calibrating how many examples we needed for how many scenarios. And in our case, we needed about four examples for one every one scenario to be able to have really good confirmation. So the deal is we really need to shed a light on acceptance criteria. And that's what happens at the now view. You are very, very concrete knowing when you're going to be done with those now view requirements. You, you, you know, you, don't, you might use things like a bulleted list, scenarios, a checklist, the acceptance test, like I just talked about using a tool called Cucumber, um, mock-ups that you walk through with sample scenarios. You need to find which technique works best for your team. But the point is, you are not done with the conversation until the partners can confirm with concrete acceptance criteria, which test all the rules, exercise the data, the interfaces, test your, um, test your performance if that's really key for quality attributes, and so forth. That's why, by the way, some people call this specification by examples. Now, you also may use prototypes and demos. I mean, prototypes are great for confirmation. And they're really also a powerful way to explore and can be part of analysis to help you uncover missing navigation flows and data and rules and so forth. Now, the thing is on your Agile team, as stories are being completed within an iteration, I'm using sort of scrum terminology. If, if you're using a time boxed approach, you might call that a sprint. What you want to do is you want to demo, you want to show your done work to your product owner on an ongoing basis. Not wait to the formal demo at the end of the at the iteration to do that kind of work, okay? So prototypes and demos can be really, really helpful. Now, when it comes to Agile, one of the most discombobulating, befuddling, and perplexing topics surrounding Agile requirements is this word, this D word, documentation. What and how much to document. And the key here is to think about value and who is being served. You know, work in process documentation just to support building and testing, mm, that's kind of low value. If you have a distributed team and you need turnover documentation, yeah, then you better clean it up. It needs a little more precision. 
the most valuable documentation is product documentation, like user help, um, marketing collateral, um, legal and regulatory documents, um, on other things that are packaged with the product. So what you want to do is have a consumer perspective, who's using the documentation, and test its value. Because as was said with extreme programming, this expression, YAGME, you ain't going to need it. That basically means assume you don't need any, and then make the case for having documentation that's valuable. So do Agile teams need to have documentation? Absolutely. But we want to calibrate the documentation based on the consumer's needs and value. And this was really, really helpful to the S team, who were kind of stuck trying to think they were needing to have a lot of documentation when we looked at installation and um, one of their field support key users' needs. What we do is we, we ran an experiment or a spike to test um, a draft of the documentation instead of assuming we needed all of this particular documentation. So, OK, summarizing then this fifth one, we confirm before, during, and after delivery. So what I hope that I've done is dispel some of those myths which can be really harmful about agile business analysis and requirements. And when it comes to the realities, what we talked about are delivering a valued product being and acting as product partners, discovering requirements just in time, using structured conversations, and confirming before and after delivery. The S team, they really had been struggling to get their footing with holistic conversations. And by doing a lot of these things, you know, I had Bob, the BA, before I left last time when I was working with the team, he came up to me and he told me that he really felt you know, in rhythm with the team, that he was now leading structured conversations and delivery sessions. And he really felt good about the work that he was doing. And the team, he was a vital member of the team. They were like, Where, where's Bob when they were getting together and if he wasn't nearby? The product owner, Polly, she was really thrilled because she was getting relief from Bob, what Bob was doing so she could do more of the strategic work and at the same time, she was really pleased because she was leveraging the expertise of her development team. They had a lot of knowledge about the product. Sam, this was really interesting in a, in a summary uh, show and tell retro with the executive management. He said that he learned more in just three days working in this mode in discovery workshops with conversation, structured conversation. He learned more in those three days than in his prior seven weeks on the project. And now the teams were focusing appropriately together, the user experience and architects and devs and testers and so forth on those stories. So the team has gotten into a rhythm and they've unlocked the glob and released, if you will, the flow of value that they have. Now, business analysis in an agile context, it's, it's not a luxury. Business analysis is essential. Requirements are needed and necessary, and it's necessary to do them in an agile way. Um, remember, being agile does not mean going fast. You go fast because you're agile. Being agile doesn't mean skimping on requirements. You're actually focusing very tightly on the most valuable ones with a lot of clarity, with a lot of unambiguity. And Agile requirements and business analysis is not about user stories. User stories are not requirements. They're the start of conversations. And in Agile, it's not about delivering stuff. It's about delivering the right stuff by exploring options and deciding what not to deliver, having rich conversations. So requirements and business analysis in an Agile context is foundational to building great teams who are building great products. I hope you'll keep the conversation going. Um, after the question round, you'll see a slide inviting you to connect with us uh, via learning at ebgconsulting.com, where we can share some additional resources and tips. And um, we are going to now move to the Q&A round. Thank you.
So folks, that was absolutely fantastic. Ellen, I thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we have Thanks lots of me. questions. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, we've got lots of questions, so uh, I'm going to get right to it. Um, first question is from Richard. Uh, do you consider BAs as facilitators and documenters of conversations directly between developers and product partners rather than an intermediary or go-between having separate conversations with each group? Richard, that's a great question. Thanks, Dave. Um, and I guess in general the answer to that question would be yes. Uh, great analysts, great business analysts are really excellent at facilitation. And so on many Agile teams, the analyst helps the team by collaborating the partner conversations, by facilitating planning and facilitating discovery workshops, but also, of course, on a tactical basis, basis often helping specify acceptance criteria and so forth. Um, the one caveat that I might have is that in some cases, you might be an analyst on an Agile team, and you have a lot of rich domain expertise and knowledge, in which case, as with facilitation in general, it's really difficult to both facilitate, manage the process of, of productive group interaction, and at the same time, participate. Um, so if you also need to participate deeply in the conversation, you may want to get a colleague or somebody else um, in another team, another group, to facilitate particularly on discovery workshops that are dealing with a preview or big view um, so that you can focus on content as opposed to process. Thanks for that question. Thank you, Ellen. That was a great answer. Um, next question is from Paul. And Paul uh, is asking, with the constant reiteration of discover, deliver, how do you manage risk when it is so dynamic? Great, great question, Paul. Thank you. Um, how do you manage risk when it, meaning the process of the ongoing discover, deliver, is dynamic? Actually, what I realized, it maybe took me a little bit to realize it the more I've been working with Agile teams, which you know this has been about 14 years already, is that um, using these practices is actually the most effective risk mitigation strategy there is. And um, because what you're doing is as you come into discovery, you're considering risk. And as I mentioned, that product options board and looking at value, we also look at things like risk. And we might want to accelerate um, mitigating risk in our delivery cycle. We may choose something that's high risk, go into delivery to mitigate that risk or test out whether the risk appears. And we also may avoid risk. But that decision is going to be made in discovery. And as you go into delivery, as long as you're, you're optimizing your delivery cycle so they're short and as high value as possible, you're not taking on a lot of risk. So each cycle is small enough you can come back in, see if you've realized the risk, or if new things have happened in, in your product or in the world that you need to consider. So you're tackling risks in micro steps, if you will, by going through this ongoing cycle of discover, deliver. It's actually one of the best risk mitigation strategies there is. And because the highest risk that any project has is around changing requirements, it's built into the, into the process of discover and deliver. Thank you, Ellen. I know risk is always a, a, a hot topic, and um, really appreciate your answer there. Uh, the next question is from Wendy. And Wendy asks, in an agile environment, how do you identify holistic design needs so developers don't have to rework when the requirements come in during future sprints? OK. Wendy, that's an awesome question and a, and a very common question. So you said identify holistic design needs so the developers don't have to do rework. Well, the fact is, let's be real, you are going to have rework in design. That is necessary if you're using an agile process. If you are doing a waterfall process, you're going to assume, pretend, or hope or wish you get all the requirements up front, and you're going to do the full design, and then, of course, things will change, as we well know. Now, but in an Agile process, you are actually going to intentionally evolve the design. You can't have a complete design 
but you're going to design for the next delivery cycle. That being said, remember, Wendy, when we were talking about the planning horizons, the different views, and I mentioned the preview and the big view, the big view being the entire product or portfolio for that, um, for that scope that you're focused on, and the preview being, say, a release. If a designer has an overall vision for the product, a great designer should be able to, at a very high level, create a high-level design, not a detailed design, but have a metaphor or concept that's going to be useful to evolve as you go through those cycles. So you're, you're continually calibrating the design, but you do have sort of an end game in mind. Great designers can do that. Thanks for that question. So the next question, um, Ellen, is from Oscar. And Os Oscar is asking, besides user stories, can you please discuss other documents that one would communicate, one would use to communicate detailed requirements? OK. So user stories, first of all, are not requirements. And they're usually, you know, they could be put in a document. But let's remember again that user stories are just a starting point for conversing about requirements. This gets to, Oscar, your question gets to the issue of requirement of documentation. And you said that you would use to communicate detailed requirements. Well, the first question that you would ask with your Agile hat on is, why do you need to de de <laughs> communicate detailed requirements, excuse me, and to whom, for what purpose? So the question around documentation, which is a very common question, is a good one. We want to, the philosophy in Agile is we want to document um, only what is necessary and sufficient. That YAGNI, as I mentioned in, in, in uh, the webinar, the you ain't going to need it approach. So how else could you communicate detailed requirements? Well, the best and most direct way is the tests themselves. The acceptance test is basically the other side of the coin. The acceptance tests are requirements. Um, the question is, who needs to get those documents? Do we need to send them to a regulatory body? Well, then uh, knowing what the regulatory body needs, and for example, in pharmaceutical, which I've uh, had the pleasure to work with a lot of teams on, there's traceability needs that are required. And you may have some traceability matrices that are needed. But we need to know, that's one tool you could use, for example. We need to know who is going to be the recipient of the documentation, and how are they going to use it? Um, because you don't want to get into the trap of creating traditional BRDs and MRDs, marketing requirements, and all these product requirement documents, just because that's all you've done before. Okay? So again, the philosophy is, who needs the documentation? Why or how are they going to use it? And can we calibrate how much detail they actually are going to get? I hope that answered, Oscar. Thank you, Ellen. Great response. Um, and this is the last question that we're going to have time for. So how do we think up, discover, and deliver iterations when discover depends on availability of stakeholders, market conditions, or customer needs? And they just changed the screen. Up. Oh, here we are. On the other hand, deliver iterations depend on organizational needs and resource structure. Uh, OK, so maybe you can repeat that question again. Yeah, I'm sorry. How do we sync up discover and deliver iterations when discover mm -hmm. depends on the availability of stakeholders, market conditions? And there was one other thing. And again, I, I lost the question. I'm sorry. So, so syncing up stakeholders with uh, the market conditions and? Um, Correct. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go with the spirit of the question, because I'm not sure I followed all the pieces of it. And the spirit of the question is, because you're constantly discovering and delivering in short cycles, that cycle could be, you know, it could be two weeks, it could be a month, it could be a day, uh, it could be um, a week. So as you come back into discovery, you're going to look around and say, OK, what do we learn from our la last delivery cycle? What has changed in the market? What has changed in our you know, conditions in our company, on the team, et cetera? And that's, that's where the change can come in. That's where you can adapt um, and adjust what you're going to pull in from your backlog to uh, decide to plan and do your refinement on for the next delivery cycle. 
that's one of the beauties of Agile is that you're flowing with those changes as you come back into discovery. I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Ellen. Ellen's a, a very busy lady. I really appreciate her being with us today um, for an outstanding presentation. So round of virtual applause for Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. So and, folks, uh, oh, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. I think there was a, one more um, contact slide for folks. Yeah, can we get we that contact gonna... slide up, please? There we go. So, um, folks, I just want to say thank you. This wraps up the first half of our day. Many thanks to Joy, Laura, and Ellen. It's been a fantastic morning. I hope everybody has really enjoyed it. And in the spirit of Ellen's presentation, has gotten um, value out of this morning's session. We do have a 10-minute break, and then we're going to come on back. We're going to have a very short video. Um, that we already played early this morning, but if you missed it, it's going to be on our business analysis initiatives here at PMI. And then Alicia Burke, the PMI product manager for credentials, will share information about our uh, professional and business analysis certification. So I encourage you to join us for that, and we'll then kick off the afternoon session. So thanks again for the morning, and we'll talk to you soon.